drive spiritually, I think, <laughs> a couple of days. And uh, just getting with God in prayer. And, um, as your topic fell to the last name, Frank and Frank. Oh. And uh, <laughs> you know, you're talking about matches and this kind of thing. And uh, the thing that stuck out to me was that uh, really, went in my room and broke hmm. and uh, before the Lord and really that is my joy is him yeah. and him alone hmm. and his ministry and what he's going to do in my life and hmm. good word Christianity is Christ it's very clear the gospel is, um, is Jesus who he is and what he does um, let me add a, um, a, little, a story which for me explains not only what the gospel is, the nature of its power. Um, some years ago, back, back about 1970, I was in Washington, D.C. and um, at National Presbyterian Church on vacation, went over to hear a great preacher for a change. And uh, I thought, well, I'm in Washington, why not? So uh, my wife and I went over to this uh, church. The, the guest preacher that day was um, a Scottish theologian named Murray, Murdo MacDonald. And uh, MacDonald was a former paratrooper. Uh, he's now retired uh, from the uh, theological faculty in Glasgow, but he was a paratrooper during the war, and he was preaching that morning on Acts 17.1 the people who have turned the world upside down have come hither also. And he was talking about the power, the upside down power, the power of the gospel to turn the world upside down. And that was the essence of the message. And as an illustration of the power and genius of the gospel, he, he told about paratrooping in Second World War behind German lines. There were two Scottish uh, chaplains they enrolled together in the Royal Air Force. They went overseas and they dropped behind German lines and they were eventually taken prisoner. Um, they were put in a concentration camp and in this particular concentration camp, the uh, Germans had constructed British barracks and American barracks with a high wire fence down the middle. And McDonald said he was put with the Americans to be their chaplain. His friend was put with the British. He said for some reasons rooted, he never did figure out, but rooted in German paranoia at the time, that nobody was allowed to talk. The German prisoners, uh, I mean the uh, British prisoners of war and the American prisoners of war were not allowed to come to the fence. They were kept away from each other. But once a day, the two chaplains, who were friends, could come to the fence and exchange greetings briefly, but always in the presence of, uh, of guards. Now, McDonald said, unknown to the uh, guards, the Americans had a little homemade radio, a little wireless and they were getting news from the outside world. And so he said, every day, I would try to take a headline or two to the fence. Then he began to say something about the, the nature of news. He said, in a, um, in a concentration camp, there is nothing, believe me, nothing as important as news from the outside. You are just totally locked in. You have no idea what's going on. And he said that for me all that time, uh, I discovered that people were just hungry, thirsty for news. So he said we would get some news and he, 
he said, I would try to take that news over and give it to my friend. <coughs> now he said, unfortunately, the German guards spoke many languages. They tried English, it didn't work. They tried French, it didn't work. But he said, I finally, we finally figured out we could speak Gaelic, in a kind of code language, I guess. And in Gaelic, he could give some news to his friend. And this went on for months and months. One day, the news came over the little wireless that the German high command had surrendered and the war was over in Germany. Now he said, all communication had broken down in Germany itself and nobody in Germany knew that. He said, the guards didn't hear about it for three days. So he said, it was unbelievably good news. He said, I took the news to the fence and gave it to my friend. Then he said, I stood at the, at the fence while my friend took the news to the British barracks. He said there was shortly thereafter a thunderous roar of celebration from the British barracks. <laughs> then he said the strangest thing happened. He said, we prisoners of war had a party, a celebration. We walked around, we were waving at the guards. Nobody told the guards anything about the news. They just, you know, they were laughing at the guard dogs. They were celebrating the, the lousy food. Everything he said in that prison camp had changed. Everything had changed. Three nights later, apparently the guards heard the noise, and he said, in the morning of the fourth day, after hearing the news, we walked out, the gates had been left unlocked, and the guards apparently had slipped out during the night. He said, we walked out fourth day uh, as freed men. But then he made this comment, we had been set free four days before by the news. The news had set us free. Now, I think that describes, for me, the power of news for people who are oppressed, locked into bad situations. It doesn't automatically get you out of a bad marriage. It doesn't automatically get you out of debt. It doesn't automatically get you out of unemployment or whatever your oppression is. But it gives you unbelievable release and joy and energy in order to cope with what you, you're dealing with. And the, uh, and the notion is, one of these days, sooner or later, you're going to walk out. You're going to go free. Now, at this point, let me say, there's a fundamental difference between Jesus Christ and Ann Landers. Um, <laughs> at least one. Ann Landers offers advice. And advice, by the nature of the case, is something you must do to make it work for you. It's good or bad advice if it works for you. Jesus is good news, not good advice. The gospel is not something I, I must do or somebody else must do. That's why sharing the gospel with the poor is not paternalizing the poor. I've sometimes heard that. It's paternalizing to the poor if you're offering them advice, telling them something how they should do or pick themselves up or whatever else. It's not paternalizing or patronizing to tell people that God appeared in Christ and died on the cross, invested in them and that their stock went up and that they are worth something and that they must repent and believe and, and become uh, sons and daughters of God. And um, that is not patronizing at all. That is news. It's news because Jesus already did it. It's not something I have to do, you see. Um, so the power of the gospel. And, the, and sometimes I think that tends to get lost in all of our machinery. Uh, the gospel is, is the heart of all ministry. And um, no matter what the church does, and it must do a lot, it uh, must not ever get into the position of advice giving in replace of news giving. Uh, we are good news people, and we should be good newsing all over the world, if I can make a verb out of a noun. Well, let's uh, 
begin then uh, another plunge into this time American history. And I'd like to suggest we begin with just a moment of prayer. Gracious God, we owe a great deal to you. You have the words of eternal life. And this is a day which you have made. We rejoice and we are glad to be in it. We are glad to be together and also with you. May we not be the same because we have met, but more than that, may your kingdom be profited until you come or call for us. For we pray in Jesus' name, amen. I want to begin a uh, discussion of American uh, history or church history or heritage as we might call it by uh, saying a little bit about the missions motifs that came out of Europe. If I, were, if I draw the um, east coast of the United States down to Florida, and of course California, and Canada, and New England, and then the Hispanic mission, which basically began 1555 when the governor of Puerto Rico founded the first colony on the East Coast, uh, Ponce de Leon. And I must remind you that um, um, how many years before 1620 is this? Sixty-five years before the pilgrims, Hispanics had built a city in this country. And from an Hispanic point of view, we stole it. <laughs> and when people think that, hey, uh, you know, they should learn English, um, they will remind us that as early as 1540, there was a church in Pecos, New Mexico. Coronado had gone to discover Colorado. Discover, I say. He was in search of these cities where it was rumored that people would live forever. And uh, he went to Taos, New Mexico. And uh, in Pecos, New Mexico, before Luther had died, 1546, Luther's dead, the Hispanics were already there. There was a church in Pecos, New Mexico. I've been to the ruin of it. Um, it's a national park. There, is, there was a church there with a pipe organ in it by 1550. 60 years, 70 years before the pilgrims landed. One of the problems with history is we write it from our own perspective. And now, we are scrambling to rewrite it to include other people. And some people resent that and say, well, why should, I mean, aren't the pilgrims our fathers? It reminds me of the teacher I heard about who required all the little kids in her class in grammar school to write an essay for Columbus Day on why I am glad Columbus discovered America. And uh, in a class were some Native American kids. I mean, that's kind of, you know, unbelievably insensitive. The teacher didn't apparently pick that up. That may be a fictitious story. It sounds so obviously insensitive that I hope it's fictitious. But the interesting thing is Sidney Alstrom of Yale, who has the classic huge book on the history of the religious people in America, the history of American religion, it's the classic. The I started reading it and I became very, very disturbed because there wasn't any reference to Hispanic U.S. or America in the first 150 pages. And not one footnote, even after that, of the scholarly work that has emerged on Hispanic uh, mission. Uh, America was being settled in large measure from the bottom up and 
Puritans, of course, came later, and French Jesuits came here. There were three basic mission movements that came early. The fourth mission movement was, of course, the Russian Orthodox. And the Russian Orthodox movement had come all the way from West Europe, all the way across Siberia, all the way down as far down as San Francisco. And they got down there even before they sold it to us, which was, what, 1869 or so. And the Orthodox mission had gone all the way down the coast. They had a seminary in Kodiak, Alaska, where I've been, lived as a child. And uh, Sitka became their Alaskan headquarters. And Aleut ministry had gone all over Alaska, all down the coast, and so on. And yet, how many of you ever studied that? as part of the founding. Partly that's because of our bias against Russia, I'm convinced. Part of it is that Eskimos and Aleuts just aren't the dominant culture in this country. And we're not really quite sure um, we, um, we want to admit that. But if you want a book on that, a brand new book on that, Michael Alexa, um, who's a Russian Orthodox, uh, now pastoring in California. And you know what? He's pastoring the Orthodox Church that was founded just outside San Francisco uh, back in the 18th century, 19th century. Uh, Michael has written a book called um, Orthodox Mission. And uh, it's um, uh, uh, not Paulus Press, Orbis Press, Orbis Press. And he is, he's been one of the primary ones recovering. He's translated all these documents. He's, he's translated the Eskimo hymnal. He knows uh, there are 11 Eskimo languages, and they all had the gospel uh, at the time of the Great Awakening in the United States, basically. Uh, Eskimos also had an awakening. But um, again, you know, we just don't uh, consider that part of our story. And I want to say that uh, the newer histories, such as Martin Marty, uh, Pilgrims in Their Own Land, 500 Years of Religion in America, are beginning to rewrite the history to include other pilgrims besides the pilgrims of Plymouth. Pilgrims in their own land. Even the Native Americans are included as pilgrims. They are the first wave of people to come. If you're really honest about the boat people and the people who've come over here, the first wave of migration, of course, were the Asians who came and settled the West and then found their way east. The second wave were Hispanics who came and Indians who came north. Third wave were Europeans who came. And they have come, of course, in successive waves. Perspective, isn't it? Yes, question? When did Cortez come? 1519, he came to Mexico and conquered it by 1520. And then Juniper Serra and others began the mission up the coast of California, Santa Barbara, all the way up. Yeah. And so the Hispanic mission was coming up and meeting this mission coming down mm -hmm. on the West Coast. But we've been basically, you see, the people who write church history have been New Englanders, Sidney Alstrom and uh, the Yale types. And so we tend to write our own history. We tend to assume that the English were the ones because that's who we are. And of course, we did become the trunk of the tree, the sheer weight, the sheer uh, uh, presence. Uh, we, we did, in fact, take over. But I think, in all candor, it isn't over yet as to who's ultimately winning this country. <laughs> I think we're becoming rapidly a third world country and, of course, Hispanic. The United States is very close to being the third Spanish nation now, third largest. We are already the second largest black nation. There are 53 nations in Africa, and uh, all but one, Nigeria, are smaller than we are in terms of population. We are, of course, the largest Jewish nation by far, we're the largest Irish nation by far. We have more Norwegians in this country than there are in Norway. 
as many Swedes as there are in Sweden. We are a very, very mixed bag as a country. And uh, so the second largest city in the country is um, Spanish Los Angeles. If you take five county area from Santa Barbara to San Diego, which is all one metro conurbation now, if you want to call it that, metroplex, and just lifted out the Hispanics, you'd find five million uh, in that metroplex, five million. That's uh, quite a shock. 80% of the public schools of Houston are black, brown, and yellow. I mean, Houston is one of the, Texas, of course, rapidly becoming a, sub, a, a Mexican state. Uh, in fact, uh, of course, from the Spanish point of view, this is just the winning back of lost territory. It's <laughs> another form of Montezuma's revenge. <laughs> uh, now, all this, I say to you, uh, is perspective. And you're in student ministry working cross-culturally or with ethnics. You really need to know that this is quite encouraging. Uh, not if you're a white Puritan and proud of that. You may feel very threatened by this sort of recovery of the history. But if you are an honest American and you give the flag salute, I believe in, you remember that phrase? Justice for all, liberty and justice for all then you, are, of course, are committed to liberation of other peoples besides your own values and your own, um, your own uh, culture. So that's happening in our day, and I celebrate that new sensitivity in this country. And what I'm celebrating, I find many evangelicals are, are feeling very unhappy about, uh, which is that black people have recovered their ethnicity through a black power movement, which is really a black people Black people in this country had their ethnicity squeezed out of them, unbelievably. Uh, when they came, for example, they came as slaves. Um, the drums were taken away from them. The drums were taken away because plantation owners weren't dumb. They knew that blacks, I mean, drums were the ma bell of the tribes. And if they allowed drums to exist, they'd be communicating up and down the coast of Carolinas. And so they took the drums away. So the blacks went out and with corn cobs and pumpkins and so on, invented the banjo and played it percussively in drum-like fashions. They played drum and eventually they incubated a whole new music in this country uh, as a result of that. And basically they've conquered the musicological US Basically, the native music of this country is jazz. That's the one thing that's just, that is uniquely American. It's a gift of the slave. It's a, and blues, right. Now, what most of us didn't know if we grew up white and separate from blacks is that all this was protest music. music. Swing Low Sweet Chariot, which we call a spiritual, was a cry for the Underground Railroad. The Jordan River is a code name for the Ohio River. Egypt land and getting out of Egypt land means getting out of the South, getting over the Mason-Dixon line, getting into freedom. We all sing those, isn't that wonderful spiritual? It's escapist religion, we thought. The blacks kept singing about heaven and as long as they were singing about heaven, there were no threat to earth. What we didn't know was this was all, it's like a black version of the book of Revelation. The book of Revelation, the early church, was being oppressed so much that whenever they wanted to talk about Rome, they just called it Babylon. And if there were any Romans that had infiltrated, they wouldn't have had the foggiest notion of what the early church was talking about because they didn't know the, you know, the apocalyptic code because the code was in Daniel. It was in the Old Testament. Things like seals and lions and wings. And, and so they would talk in this, this masked apocalyptic language. Now, I should tell you that the church today in the Middle East is doing much of the same thing. Americans are just, who go to an Orthodox worship in Arab countries, for example, just hardly believe. It's just so foreign. So call them and say, well, why don't you speak the plain gospel? Well, they've lived with 1,300 years of Islamic oppression and spying. And so they've developed in their iconography and other symbols 
and, and in the Coptic Church's refusal to use Arabic for much of their service, they continue to use Coptic, an ancient language no Muslims know. And so Americans get frustrated. We go over there and we want them to be with it and use the language of the people, but they have learned to speak and to re keep their language because it's a way of surviving. And uh, so much of this that went on in the Bible has gone on with these groups, of course. And black people have reached back now, and the Black is Beautiful movement is the attempt to recover black ethnicity, black ethnicity. And that recovery has created a whole new sense of identity for black people in this country. Uh, it's still not finished, as witness Jesse Jackson's caravan today on its way to the Democratic Convention. There's still a refusal to take seriously uh, black people, black culture, black contribution. Uh, but in fact, um, in, in many ways they've won. Uh, Mexican culture is winning. I mean, look at, have you ever been to Wendy's lately? Yeah. You know, their salad bar. I mean, it's rivaling the hamburger folks. You know, how un-American could it be? Uh, no, it, it, it culturally, um, even black cosmetics, black music, and many of these things are converting our culture. In fact, Samuel Eliot Morrison, who wrote a, ma you know, a massive history of the American people. It's not a church history, it's a history of the American people. He starts out by saying, 10,000 years from now, an archaeologist are going to be swarming over the ruins of America. They're going to be digging in our backyards, and they're going to be finding barbecue pits and campers. <laughs> and, and they're going to assume that the Indians have conquered us. <laughs> Isn't that interesting? I mean, it really, it kind of blew my mind, but I think in a way, you know, the American camper and the backyard barbecues and so on, there's a sense in which, yes, we oppress the Indians, and then culturally, they come back and they're winning. And it's just fascinating to see this happening, and I, that's why I wanted to say this. I, I say history is partly perspective. Much of it, history is perspective. And history tends to be written by the victors. So all these years, you pick up history books and uh, church history books, you read about pilgrims, the first people here, as though the Indians weren't here, of course. And, and then to say nothing about the fact that all those other people uh, were here even before, even with the gospel. Though it wasn't our kind of gospel. They didn't have our four law track. They didn't have our particular approach. Let me say something now about three Indian or ministries to the Indians. This, this has been one of the most interesting areas of research. Lewis Hankey, H-A-N-K-E, wrote a book. It was his dissertation done at Indiana called Aristotle and the American Indians. Aristotle and the American Indians. Fascinating book. You might say, what on earth? Aristotle and the American Indians. Here is basically what happened. When the Hispanic conquerors following Columbus, now 1492, 1500, 1520, when they started coming over here and landing down in Hispanola, down in Mexico and southern part of the United States and down into Peru and so on, when they came back, all those ships, by the way, had priests on them, Jesuits, uh, because remember, 1540, the Jesuits had been founded. There were Jesuits that were pouring. Augustinians were pouring. I uh, read about the Augustinian conquest of Mexico. There were other groups, uh, and uh, remember that was Luther's order. There were, there were people like that coming down here, and they would come home on the ships back to Spain. Charles V, remember him? The guy who convened the Diet at Worms where Luther gave his defense of the gospel in 1520, and later Philip II, these are the, uh, respectively, the uh, nephew and the uh, wife of English monarchs, remember? So you, just, so you see the interplay of the world at that time. Charles V called a conference at Valladolid in Spain and Barcelona, and this conference went for about 40 years. 
I mean, it's kept, it was a sort of a disputation that just went on and on and on periodically. And what it was, was how shall we treat these new Indians we're finding? There were two points of view. Bartholomew Las Casas, Las Casas is, means houses. Bartholomew Las Casas was one of those Jesuits who came back and said, they are equal to us there. My proposal is, as a mission policy, that we uh, evangelize, we disciple, we train them to be priests and brothers, and that we treat them as equals. And he had already been doing that. He had been training uh, laity and clergy, and um, he came back to Spain to argue that. Almost like Paul, the apostle, comes back and argues for a point of view at the Council of Jerusalem. However, a man named Sepulveda, famous scholar in Spain, Sepulveda Boulevard, by the way, in Los Angeles, uh, that name you'll see. Um, Sepulveda was a great scholar, and he had just translated Aristotle's politics er, and other works into uh, Spanish and Latin, so it could be read by the people in Spain. And Aristotle, of course, had taught clearly that some men were naturally born slaves. And so Sepulveda argued against Las Casas and said, these are inferior peoples. We should not treat them as equals. We should continue to control the church. And the conquistadores, those military people who kept accompanying the exploiters, uh, eventually under, and this went on f all the way through Charles V, through Philip II, and all during that time, this was a giant contest. And finally, Spain adopted a system called the encomienda system. Encomienda system was a way of paternalizing the natives and controlling them. They built like reservations, uh, farms, and the mission that was planted was a way of controlling the natives around it not liberating, but more or less controlling. And that was rooted in, in the Hispanic um, understanding that these were inferior people. So they set up mission structures to keep them locked into their place. Now, Lewis Hankey points out that these documents are in museums and uh, had never been studied. This is really original research. Uh, he went over to Spain and, and got this, and he discovered that nobody ever finally, ultimately said, let's go with Sepulveda and reject Las Casas. It just sort of evolved that way. The, lud, the, the lust for gold just finally overcame the missionaries. And so the Hispanic conquest of South America involved uh, first take their land, take their people, and then organize them into encomiendas so on. And almost overnight, of course, you could say Latin America became Catholic because it was all highly structured in these encomienda systems, all the way down the Ap Andean spine. And of course, Brazil had its own Portuguese uh, versions of that. In contrast to the Latin American model, of course, the, the Jesuits who went to France, I mean, went to New France, which was Canada, Quebec, had a second model. They did what Las Casas did, and they went to Canada and they treated the Indians as equals. And they intermarried, and they literally created a Creole culture in Canada. A Canadian Catholic, um, basically the Indians were included into the mainstream in Quebec, and there is a Creole. Uh, some of that Creolism is in Cajun country down in Louisiana because of some uh, historical things. So here were two totally different mission models. They both came out of Catholic Europe, but they had different anthropologies, the result of which is that they had different cultural side effects. Now, the Puritans came. I've already given you some clues on this one. What did the Puritans think of Indians. Who were they? Canaanites. Canaanites, of course, in the New Israel. And what did the Bible say we should do with them? Right. 
So the Puritan foreign policy model, coming out of a literal reading that Boston is the new Israel, Amalekites and Narragansetts and so on, if you really wanted to, you could kill them. But basically what you should do is banish them from the land. And so the Puritan model was banish the people, get them out of the land, empty it so we can take it over. Uh, by the way, <laughs> have you been to New Mexico? There are 19 self-governing governing pueblos in New Mexico. These are the reservations, the sort of Soweto's of America, the sort of um, homelands that we've created, like South Africa has done. And we've got these people living out there. We pushed them 7,500 feet up in elevation. So the growing season is very short and the agricultural land and there's no buffalo and you know we did it, we, do, we just did this awful thing. We pushed them into these mountains and they, they were practically starving for about a hundred years. But now guess what? He that sitteth in the heavens shall laugh, right? <laughs> those, <laughs> yeah, underneath those pueblos and reservations is one half of the nation's uranium and coal and oil, you wouldn't believe. And so much of the ministry to the Native Americans now has got to be, and the Presbyterians are doing the best job, I think, of empowering tribal people. Not only, I've taught, I taught for the Presbyterians in New Mexico twice, evangelism courses for credit in the extension programs uh, for pastors and Native evangelists and so on. And basically at the same time they're studying ministry, they're studying for an MBA because they want to make sure those lands don't get ripped off, which there are already bills in Congress to take it away from them again. This time for national security reasons. Can't let all those people have all that uranium and all that oil and all that, you know. So uh, the Indians are really gearing up. By the way, for the first time since Columbus, Indians population in this country has gotten up to what it was when Columbus landed. And it's one of the fastest growing, percentage-wise, populations in the country. So we're not done with the Native Americans yet. Uh, I lived next door to Willie Williman, who's a, whose family is Menominee from Wisconsin. They're Native Americans, and we share a backyard fence, a common fence, and um, common fish and other goodies from that relationship. But I, I'm, he's there to remind me that uh, the Native American was here and is here, present and growing. Now, I think this is fascinating because there are three totally different anthropologies, theological anthropologies, three very different views of persons, and as a result, three very different mission structures, you see? Whatever your, your theology is has got to inform the structure it will, intentionally or not, because their theology is not only a believing system, it's a behaving system. And so the Canadian one has a view of equality, and there are two not equality models, and they're quite different. And they are different because they read the Bible quite differently, or they read Aristotle. Now let me throw in my little hooker at the end, which is not in Lewis Hankey. Is liberation theology then in the South today a revolt against the Bible or evangelical theology, as I've heard some describe it? I don't think so. I think it's primarily a revolt against Aristotelian structures that were forced upon Latins in the name of the Bible and in the name of Christ. And therefore, I do not see uh, liberation theology as anybody, I mean, it has its excesses and it has its problems. Um, they're using Marxist categories in some cases, um, but there you have to be careful too, because you have to understand Marx as a diagnostician is different from Marx as a prognostician. And there are some things Marx diagnostically said that were dead right. His prognostications for how you solve those problems I think are dead wrong. But I find many Americans are just lumping all 
Latins, and all liberationists, all um, uh, of those kinds of theologians in one sort of garbage bag or one scary bag. That's not fair, and it's not wise. It's not truthful to do that. One has to be very careful. But I think if we understand this history, we'll understand why Native Americans and others are not as receptive to the gospel as we might wish. They really are not very receptive in many cases. And I think we must understand that there are some good, solid historical reasons and some reasons we need to repent in dust and ashes and, and go in and build new bridges uh, acknowledging that. Well, that's my little introduction to America. It's off. Uh, it's not in any book that's yet been written on uh, American church history, but I think it really is important in the light of who we are and where we live and what we're trying to do in ministry that we understand these historical dynamics. Yes? Are these the early parts? Uh, yes. Yes. Really We're talking about 16th century. There were some other attitudes as well. Yes. 16th, 17th century, basically what I've been talking about here. Well, let me, uh, let me, um, then move to the more traditional understanding of American history. Okay, uh, you know, I'm going to fill in this now with some other things. I want to talk a little bit about the settlement of the East Coast by the Puritans, which turned out ultimately, as Philip Schaff reminds us, to be the great um, <coughs> trunk of American religion. If it's a tree, the biggest trunk in this bramble. <coughs> would be um, a Puritan. And at least up until the um, 1740s or so, the um, religion in America is basically an extension of Europe. It's not an indigenous, nativist religion. But after the Great Awakening, and particularly after the Second Awakening, uh, American Christianity is distinct from European Christianity. But there was this roughly a hundred years. Okay, let's take the 1620s, 1630s. Our Puritans came to this country uh, and set about to Puritanize Boston, as you know. And, uh, and they, Puritans were not independents or separatists. Puritans were Anglicans who wanted to purify the church. They believed in an established church. Ah, oh, thank you. That's very helpful. Um, if you go back to my little chart yesterday, which isn't my little chart, one I borrowed, but it shows that um, the Presbyterian or the Puritans really believed in established church. They just didn't believe in the Roman or the Anglican versions of it. So when they came to Boston, they tried to set up a holy commonwealth like Israel. And the leader of this was a guy named John Cotton. Now, John Cotton was not the founder. That turned out to be Winthrop. John Winthrop was the leading Pur Puritan. And on the Arabella, he gave a sermon, God hath given thee this plantation, and Boston was to be a city on a hill like Jerusalem and so on. And uh, the whole thing was couched in a theological framework to make Boston the new Jerusalem, Massachusetts the new Israel. And the Puritans came in to do that. 1630, Roger Williams, also Puritan, came. He was not Baptist at that point. He was just a Puritan. And he took the church in up in Salem. And he was a teacher in that church, as Cotton was in the other one down in Boston. Um, very shortly, John Cotton wrote things that Roger Williams just couldn't, uh, couldn't buy. And so Roger Williams decided to leave the Holy Commonwealth to protest because he really couldn't accept it as the new Israel. And he moved over and founded Rhode Island. And he founded Providence and invited anybody who wanted to be free to move in to that colony. So Rhode Island then is the Baptist state, as it were. In 1639, he founded 
a believing Baptist church, he or John Clark. There's a debate about which of the two were more important at that point. But nonetheless, Roger Williams is a founder father figure. Now, he wrote a he wrote a book called The Difference Between Israel and All of the States. We don't have the book, but as Perry Miller, a former teacher at Harvard, points out, and the greatest scholar in America on Puritanism. He's dead now, but he's many of the books uh, that are on Puritans in this country would be P Perry Miller books. And Perry Miller has a wonderful biography of, uh, of Roger Williams. Um, as Miller pointed out, we can piece together the book by its quotations in other people's books. We've got about 32 pages of quotes. And if you put together Roger Williams' argument, it goes something like this. Uh, uh, Israel was called by God. It was a very special people, distinct from us, and it's not possible to interpret the Bible the way you're doing it. It was a hermeneutical um, issue with Williams, you can't do a one-for-one. One. Israel does this, therefore we can do that kind of thing. And as I say, to prove it, he went out and lived with Indians and embraced them and uh, etc. He didn't like them particularly. He called their, their uh, tents and, and dwellings filthy holes and so on. But he, he went out there and he translated their language. In fact, the third volume of his uh, collected seven works is um, called Key to the Language of America. He literally went out and, and learned the languages of these Indians and, you know, just always trying to protest this Puritan uh, model of Boston and Massachusetts. Finally, he wrote a book which was the first book on religious liberty in this country, and it was called The Bloody Tenant for the Cause of Conscience. He published it, sent it to John Cotton. Uh, as though that would um, stop, uh, you know, the abuses in Massachusetts. John Cotton wrote a book equally long in response called The Bloody Tenant for the Cause of Conscience, Yet More Bloody. Yeah. So Roger Williams, a few years later, wrote a third book called The Bloody Tenant for the Cause of Conscience, Yet More Bloody, Washed White in the Blood of the Lamb. <laughs> and that was the end of this correspondence. But, you, you know, they were, were writing books to each other on this subject. It was just phenomenal uh, what was going on. And, but but a, a phenomenal issue was at stake there, and that is, do we really believe in freedom or not? Especially freedom for people we don't like. <coughs> and we're still carrying that one on. To what extent are gays, for example, in our culture, or those like uh, Maharajas and, or Maharishis or Gurus, or, are they free? Um, do they have civil rights? Do they have uh, rights to propagate? Uh, to what extent? And we're still struggling with that. And that struggle was right from the very beginning. Uh, only four states at the time of the American Revolution granted freedom. And Rhode Island was one, Pennsylvania was another, Delaware and New Jersey. By the time of 1776, only those four granted religious freedom. Uh, Quakers could be hung in other places. In fact, they were hung in Boston in the 17th century, four of them on the Boston Common once. I guess that was the last time they hung them. but. Uh, then, of course, under Thomas Jefferson, about 1687 or 1787, uh, Virginia passed its bill of religious freedom. And then, uh, of course, several other states followed. It was not until 1818 that Connecticut finally, over the protests of Lyman Beecher, agreed to religious freedom. Uh, so it, it took a long, long time for those 13 original colonies to do what Roger Williams was saying they should do as early as 1640. It took almost 200 years before the 13 colonies would agree. Now, of course, we're still testing that one. Do, uh, by the way, in Baptist um, history, 
on separation of church and state and things like, um, uh, you know, do you give freedom to people who are really disgusting um, because they don't agree with us? Um, Baptists have learned, or at least um, constitutionally we have learned, that uh, yes, the civil rights of everyone are guaranteed. We distinguish, I distinguish, um, two principles. The difference between advocacy and co-belligerency. That is, I will fight for a disgusting person's right to give a speech and win converts, get housing, and jobs. But that is not advocating their lifestyle or their, it's just co-belligerent with them on their liberties and freedoms under the Constitution. And I think citizenship in this country requires us to keep the law and the Constitution. And uh, since I'm committed to the Constitution and the separation of church and state, I make that distinction. So I will march in a parade, uh, perhaps to allow people, uh, black people or other people, to get their civil rights and their constitutional rights, even though the person might be a disgusting uh, non-Christian, uh, even profaning my Lord, which wounds me grievously. But I think we have to make that distinction, uh, or we're going to be dead uh, in this country, because we cannot, I mean, the issue of the dominion theologians we were talking about is can you turn the clock back to Massachusetts and make everybody Puritan. I, and I just don't think you can do that. It, I think it'll get worse. Do you want to know something? That has been tried. That was tried in the great push that finally led to prohibition. If there was anything that amounted to uh, an attempt to legislate the kingdom of God in this country, it was that entire movement that went on and it was incredibly successful, and finally they got a, the bill passed, a constitutional law banning alcohol. And what that did, of course, in Chicago is produce the Cabones uh, and a uh, whole underground economy and, uh, and all of that. So I think we have to be very careful in how we do legislate. And I think these are issues that Williams and Cotton were wrestling with, which we're still wrestling with. And the issues are very, very complex. Mm -hmm. I had just, from perspective, when did the Dutch reform go to South Africa? The Afrikaners seemed to communicate a lot of the same kind of principles that they were doing in Boston, you know, do Israel. And yes, that's right. right. Yes, well. Similar times that they were going down. Yes. Um, after the, um, or roughly about the same time that uh, there was a, the Thirty Years' War in Europe, 1618 to 1648, uh, Holland, the Low Countries were embroiled in battles, and um, that's why you have a line across the Netherlands, and south of the line is Flemish, and um, they have their own language. North of the line, Dutch with their own language. Um, th those decisions were made in the 17th century, and William um, of England was one of those kings that came over, William of Orange or Rengia, came over and uh, helped fight that battle. It was after that and around that time that Calvinists who were in Holland decided, and, and remember, they were merchant marine peoples. The Dutch were the sailing peoples. And they were already sailing around Africa, and they noticed that it was a gorgeous, beautiful land. And so like they were literally the pilgrims of, of Holland, and they went down and colonized. And then, of course, when the British came and took over uh, that South Africa, the Afrikaners, as they were the white tribe people, then did their grand trek, much like the um, Seminole Indians of Florida trekked out to Oklahoma, the Vale of Tears, Trail of Tears, so that Afrikaners had their trek and they went up to Johannesburg from the Cape, and they built a Mormon-like uh, culture, religious faith. It's a faith culture, ethnicity, it's all mixed. It's, I think Mormon is, is the way to describe what they've done. And of course, they, they said, again, the land was empty. We, we got here as soon as any black people did, and you know we have every right to be here, and it's a high elective.
theology. But it's, yes, it, it, it comes out of the same sorts of Calvinism that uh, came to Puritanism. Yeah. But, of course, if you're an American, um, and I, of course, run into missionaries all the time uh, who are from South Africa or they're in that country who say, but, you know, the blacks there have it better than anybody. Why do they, you know, why can't they? And don't they know that uh, the whites have given them everything? And, you know, it's, and, of course, I love to turn that argument around and say, well, let's imagine 1776 again. And let me remind you that American colonists were being treated by Britain better than any other colony. And yet, they did armed rebellion against, because political uh, work didn't do it. And I said, would you have been a Tory or not? Would you have fought against Britain, a military overthrow of the legitimate British government? In 1776, 17 to 1783, the War of American Independence? Well, almost all of them would have. You know, I mean, they, they, they think so. But when they answer me, of course, they don't want our experience to be interpreted as legitimate for blacks in South Africa to legitimately arm themselves to overthrow an, a government that's imposed uh, that gives them absolutely no political redress so that about the only thing you can do is uh, overthrow. Same with Palestinians. Um, so our revolution, by the way, one of the things that I'll be saying about after our revolution is that we as a nation uh, have given inspiration to people to overthrow uh, unjust governments. That's our whole rationale for existence. And for us not to, uh, to say yes, some can do it and not others for ideological reasons, be as I think has been happening in, in, in the Reagan years um, and even before. Uh, I think is a real problem. You have a comment? Um, the whole thing in the Puritan, this whole thing we're talking about, how does that link back to Calvinism again? And did Calvin ever talk about the Israel state in terms of anything like this? Or? Yes, the continuity is that the Old Testament is, is continuitous with the new and the church is the new Israel okay, so in Calvin Calvinism. Yes, about that in that's right. Yes, baptism is the new circumcision and so there is the continuity in the Calvinist tradition that Puritans just went out and dotted the I's and, you know, went further. And that's why we sometimes call Anglo-Saxon Puritanism or Anglo-Saxon Calvinism, which is Puritanism, as applied Calvinism. Because what often was a theological issue for Calvin became a moral issue and a political issue for Puritans. Yeah, that's the distinction. Okay. Uh, the middle colonies, of course, were mixed. Puritans in the north, Anglicans in the south. The mix of Swedes in New Jersey, and of course Rutgers University eventually became, uh, was a, a college founded in New Jersey by Reformed, but uh, there were other groups, Dutch Reformed, New York, New Amsterdam, etc. Uh, so the, the mix was in the middle, but the two English colonies were the haves, the Anglican, the established Anglicans, and the established Puritans. And one of the great miracles of the Revolution is that they could ever have gotten together to throw off the British yoke. <laughs> they just have to say that they, there was, they couldn't agree on anything in England. It was just amazing that the Virginian, sophisticated Anglicans of William and Mary could agree with the Harvard Bostonian uh, Sam Adams uh, radicalities and so on and, and agree. And that raises a question, how could that ever have happened? And that gives us a chance to talk about the Great Awakening. Uh, in 1726, Friedenheisen was starting to visit people, as I mentioned, and of course, um, <coughs> Whitfield came shortly thereafter. Edwards was pastoring and writing and teaching, and, and the gospel was breaking out, and people were being converted 
And Wesley lit or, uh, Whitfield literally came each visit and did a kind of figure eight through the colonies. The result of that was an incredible uh, significance um, for the awakening, Listen, or for, for the revolution. This is um, Winthrop Hudson's Religion in America, third edition, a historical account of the development of American religious life. Good book. It's one I've used for a text. Uh, easy to read and uh, scholarly. Um, Although the awakening was productive of controversy and strife, it was paradoxically at the same time a great unifying force which gave to four-fifths of the Christians in America a common understanding of the Christian life and faith. Now that's an interesting comment. Um, even as America was splintering into denominations, and states and colonies at the same time that it was fragmenting geographically and linguistically, guess what? The revival had spread across all those lines, or most of those lines, not all, but, but most, so that the core of what people's worldview and view of the faith and church and society and culture, values, was becoming unified. Now that's an interesting thing. Those who think ecumenicity is just, hey, let's cozy up and get all our church structures to come together, like the ecumenical movement of the 50s. Let's fold all our denominations in one, one super church, have missed something very profound that is truly ecumenical, that was happening and often happens in this kind of case. The Great Awakening gave Americans a sense of commonality. People who were in the middle colonies as Presbyterians heard William and Gil Tennant, his son, William Tennant. He wrote a book called uh, To the Unconverted Clergy, <laughs> very <laughs> subtle. Uh, and and these, these lay people and these evangelists went out and they preached to the church people and you ended up with uh, a converted church. And and Whitfield, a Calvinist, went to Arminians, he went to Calvinists, he went to Anglicans, he went to Puritans, he went to Quakers, you know. These people went all around and people heard the same gospel. It's the kind of ecumenicity you get if you turn on Christian television today, Channel 38 in Chicago, and one half hour you're, you got Lloyd Ogilvie, then you got a Southern Baptist, then you got a black Pentecostal, then you got Roman Catholics, you got all these people. It's like an electric ecumenical movement. And I'm convinced there are probably a whole lot of people. They just keep that on all day long and sit there and stare at it. And that what's happening is, well, it appears at one level that, oh my goodness, this is a smorgasbord of religion. But I have a feeling that the way people integrate that, psychologically and otherwise, is that they borrow and they mix it all up and they, it becomes a kind of theological jello uh, before it's done. And, and, uh, and they don't really know quite what it is to be Catholic. And, and they go to their Catholic church and talk about being born again. And they go to the Baptist congregation and talk about our parish it has problems. <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> you know, I think that's happening. Uh, I think that's happening in this country. And I want to say it's been happening right from the start. So uh, what, what you ended up with was what looked like the fragmentation, but then the Great Awakening. But the Great Awakening went from roughly 1540 to 1560, and then it shut off almost overnight. For, uh, excuse me, 1760. 1740 to 1760. It was roughly 20 years of revivalism. And in that period, of course, there was enormous controversy. Edwards, every book he'd write would be answered by Charles Chauncey of Boston, who was an called an old light. Edwards was a new light. And, and uh, you know, it, it was just um, uh, remarkably uh, yeasty time for scholarship. These, but, but most of the church didn't read those books. And so they weren't um, uh, touched by it. Let, let me say something about the name awakening now. What do we mean by awakening? because now we would just call it revival. Awakening is a distinctive Calvinist Puritan term. 
and it has to be understood that way. Jonathan Edwards is the best example of a Puritan. Jonathan Edwards was applied Calvinism writ large. He out Calvin Calvin. He was an incredible man. He was a great scholar and original thinker. Uh, his psychological uh, insights were just way ahead of his time. He was, he was, he re reads everything, he integrated, he studied all the time, taught his kids, his daughters, he had a house full of daughters and taught them all Greek and Hebrew when they were kids. He really believed in women scholars. Uh, back when he went off to be president of Princeton, after he had been expelled from his church in 1650 because the people finally got tired of his discipleship model, he went out and preached to drunken Indians at Stockbridge for eight years. And then when he um, went to uh, Princeton to be president, and the Edwards house is right there on the campus next to the old building in Princeton. He, um, he was only president six weeks. He, he, he took a smallpox vaccination to, to sort of prove to the whole student body that it would be good, and it gave him smallpox and he died. But he, uh, when, before he went, he apologized to the trustees that his Greek and Hebrew had slipped, that it wasn't as good as it should be, and he was probably not worthy to be president and all that. But then he took his daughter uh, to be with him uh, and left the, fam the other part of the family back on the Indian Reservation uh, uh, to become president of Princeton. Very interesting person. But he used to go on horseback. He'd go calling. <clears throat> he'd wear his black gown. And he'd, the horse knew where to go. So Edwards would read books the whole time he was commuting. <laughs> and, and Olga Winslow, Ol Ol uh, Olga Winslow has this biography of Edwards where she said he'd come back from visiting a parish, some farm out in the hinterland, and he'd be covered with paper because what he did, he had these paper clips, these pins. He'd go down to New Amsterdam once a year and buy supplies, and he'd buy reams of pins. And so he'd get an idea, you know, and he'd pin it on his coat, and it was like he was in a paper blizzard. And the people were just in awe. They couldn't believe it. Here was the pastor coming into town covered with little scraps of paper because he'd written this idea. And the horse, of course, would bring him back and deposit him at his home. And he'd be thinking all these great thoughts. And, you know, I, I, it just blows my mind. Um, wonderful. I have, I have two, my, my prized possession in my house probably is that next to my desk, I have two pins. Jonathan Edwards used to put his 1740s manuscripts together, two of them. What he would do, he would, um, to preach, he'd preach one hour, he'd read it. He'd take four sheets of paper, fold it over, and um, he'd make a quarto volume, and he'd put two pins in the spine to hold it. Half the sermon would be the exegesis of the text, and the other half would be what he called the uses of the sermon. Point one, point two, point three. And he was so penetrating with the uses that his, it was like darts. It was like he's shooting at members of his congregation, though he never called anybody by name. As one writer said, when Edwards got done with the uses of the sermon, there were no more stumps to hide behind. I mean, he just, <laughs> <laughs> and he did it all from the text. You know, the text means it doesn't mean this, it doesn't mean this, it doesn't mean this, it doesn't mean this, you know, go through 20 of those. It does mean this, it does mean this, it does, <laughs> it means this, it means this, it means this. It, I mean, the penetration of that kind of preaching. And people, when he preached uh, Sinners in the Hands of the Angry God, which was a sermon on Deuteronomy, a text, they shall slide in due, their feet shall slide in due time, which was, an image of the human race sliding down into hell and no one was able to stop them. He was up there reading away his sermon and people were falling in the aisle, crying out to God. I mean, here's this guy up there reading. He didn't even know that they were repenting. He was just so into this <laughs> sermon that people were on the floor, God help us. And it, you know, the revival was breaking out and here's this guy up there with his glasses reading the sermon on their feet shall slide in new time. Wonderful, it, nothing like Billy or these other evangelists who are out there a preaching now that you know in in exhorting and looking him in the eye or anything like it it's just incredible that this guy was a revivalist now what does a puritan mean by awakening they mean that everybody is dead in sin and hell i mean sin and corruption and they're on their way to hell and there's nothing in the world they can do about it but they should come to church anyway 
the commandments require, you must come to church and hear the preaching of the word. Now, it won't do you any good. In fact, it'll condemn you. Jonathan Edwards felt you should, and every Puritan felt, you must cram Bible into everything that lives and moves and breathes. Just stash them full of Bible. Because when they go off to judgment, God's going to use that to judge them. However, if the Holy Spirit does get a hold of them, then all that knowledge, which doesn't do them a bit of good, but if the Holy Spirit should awaken them, then all that knowledge will come bursting forth as, quote, religious affections. That's the title of one of his books, as religious affections. For Edwards, it was like a photograph. It's like a dark room. It's like, um, you know, all that Bible knowledge. You catechize, doesn't do one good. In fact, the more catechisms you go to, the worse your sin is, okay? <coughs> the, the greater your damnation, the hotter the fire will be in hell. Okay, you just, you know, going to Sunday school and having a whole list of perfect attendance pins, knowing all the verses of the Bible, memorizing and giving theological lectures doesn't do one bit of good. In fact, it it's, it's the very thing God's going to use to condemn you. However, if perchance you are one of the elect and God chooses to awaken you by his spirit, it's like a photograph lying in the dark room. When the, when the solution hits it, it will be transformed. All that knowledge, all that Bible, it'll, it'll just come alive. It, it, it just, the picture will come out and the color and the brightness. And that's why for him, salvation is, is, is transformed religious affections. And of course, there's nothing you can do to earn it. There's nothing you can do uh, that the preacher should not use any unusual means to try to force it, because it's only if God chooses, and you're one of the elect, can it ever happen. Mm -hmm. So salvation is equals awakening, you see? It's the awakening of the spirit, the awakening of the spirit. Up until then, you are, quote, sodish, sodish. You're just, uh, you're not awake. You're just like a person just half asleep. And when the spirit awakens you, all that knowledge which has been killing you now brings you alive. Now that is about as, as graphically as I can describe what Puritans meant by awakening and how they meant to do evangelism. It was just to go out there and fill people full of the Bible and not necessarily try to, you know, get them all guilty and all that because a scare theology really isn't going to do it. You can scare them out of hell, but you cannot frighten them into heaven. Only the Spirit can do that. And there's some critique of Edwards, namely that he really was so good that he scared people out of hell, and, and, but then turned around and said, you know, um, you can't be saved unless God chooses to save you. I mean, now the difference between the first and second awakening and Edwards and Finney is precisely at that point. You see, Finney thought you could do something once the person had been frightened out of hell and was saying, well, what can I do to be saved? But Edwards was fighting Arminianism. He was a Whitfieldian Calvinist, and he really didn't go any further. But this Great Awakening set the tone for revivals. But it was an, I must tell you that this 18th century Great Awakening was a Calvinist revival, very different from a Billy Graham revival or, or another kind of revival. It was a Calvinist revival from start to finish, pretty much. And as I say, the results of that were just extraordinary. There were uh, this whole national consciousness. Institutional results were phenomenal. Log College was founded, which of course became uh, the College of New Jersey. Dartmouth, which had be was Moore's Indian School. Dartmouth, um, goodness, uh, Delaware, Brown. The Baptists formed Brown University, partly because they couldn't, um, uh, Baptists were not accepted at Harvard. Uh, but a whole spate of colleges grew out of this awakening. The theological temper uh, 
was set for this country, the sort of mood. Uh, America became, uh, people became aware that average Christianity wasn't necessarily the only way, that if God sent a revival, some good things could happen. People learned to pray for revival. Denominations spun out of the Great Awakening, um, like flowers. Churches grew, and institutions grew, and models of ministry grew, and societies for women in ministry emerged. Because it became important, you see, for women to give testimonies to become members of the church. Because now you had conversion, for many, had become a means test for membership. And no longer was your child baptismal certificate enough, even for many uh, pedo-baptist churches that would normally have accepted that, now said, well, you know, uh, what is your profession of faith in Christ? And so women who had always before this been sitting down and not saying anything, they wouldn't be allowed to talk in public, had to stand up and talk in public. They had to share their testimony to become members of churches. And some of the women's testimonies were so extraordinary that they were invited to churches around the colonies to share the testimony. And pretty soon, it, one result of the awakening was women preachers. And that's basically, long story short, slaves and free. Uh, in New England and other places, slavery was changed. Societies uh, for the freedom of the slave and the education of the slave uh, emerged. It was a kind of a phenomenal thing. Now, let me ask you something. Is revivalism a conservative or a radical event? Are revivals conservative? That is, are they a sort of back to the first century movement? Are they the kind of thing that is going to bring us back to the good old days? Or are revivals fundamentally radical, changing society at its very root. Which do you think it is? I've, I've sort of biased the question. <laughs> I should tell you that there is, there's been quite a robust debate on this in American church history because revivalism has been one of those things that people say, oh, revivals, oh, those are the people that want to get back to the Bible and back to the 50s. You know, and back to the good old days when husbands went to work and wives stayed home and kids obeyed parents and white people ran everything and you know we you know back to hmm? well, but but there is an idea that sort of Billy Graham sets the clock back right that that evangelism is a way of sort of keeping things traditional. And I'm here to tell you that having looked at this issue a great deal and read a good bit about this, that I don't think that's true. I think, I think fundamentally, and I'm going to demonstrate it a little later with the second awakening book I brought, but I do think that, um, that um, the scholars on the side of radicalism are true and that if you really want to change society, get a revival going. And that you'll have faster change than not. And all those sort of liberal pastors I know who don't want to get involved in, um, in evangelism because they say, ah, you know, I really want to get around and change society. Mm -hmm. I think they're going about it wrong. I think the history ought to show them that, as a matter of fact. Mm -hmm. you, question? Yeah, well, the only thing is, some of those people seem to say that revival may be going back to the basics. I mean, yeah. some of those revivals that take place today or the idea of Baptist, you want revival. Mm -hmm. That's really what they do. Sure. Mm -hmm. True revival, or what you're talking about, a real revival, whatever you want to call it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, it's listen. Really yeah. That's right. Uh, reconciliation occurs often, uh, slaves and free and all of those. Uh, 10.30, I think that we should take a little break and uh, see you about 10.45. <laughs>